All of life is filled with crises and decisions. There are right decisions, wrong decisions, high roads, low roads, and almost every day there will be a fork in the road. Where you are today is due to the turn in the road you took yesterday. <laughs> so, you know, I remember this uh, little Christian play that, about the prodigal son done by ants called Ansylvania. And they said, you win or lose by what you choose. God elevated Daniel to a, a leader in this country that he wasn't even from. You know, he was a captive, taken captive as a teenager, and he ended up being one of the top leaders of two of the biggest empires in the world. You know, that's kind of remarkable in itself because even nowadays, you know, when people have like despot leaders, you know, people who are like total rulers, leaders, when there's a government change, they get rid of the old people. They don't want people from the old government coming in and trying to, you know, undermine them having alliances with other people from the other government. Like Daniel influenced five different kings. Remember when they kidnapped Daniel or they abducted him from his country and they took him, they're going to train him in the ways of the Chaldeans and they're going to teach him the new language, which was Aramaic. They gave him a new name. They're trying to change his identity. The world tries to press its identity onto us and we have to know who we are. Daniel knew who he was. And even though he was given a new identity, it's interesting because when you look over into chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson is throwing the feast, the handwriting on the wall. He doesn't know what it is. His grandma, which was uh, Nebuchadnezzar's wife, he says in verse 11, she says in verse 11, There's a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, which is your grandfather, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this Daniel. He was able to retain his identity as Daniel. God is his judge. And then she said, in whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. That is a characteristic of why Daniel excelled and achieved in this empire because he knew who he was. He never wavered from his call on his life that God was his judge. He was going to stand before God and he was accountable to God. And that was what gave him the power to stand in the face of this government. He had faith and faith is a way of living without scheming. You remember where it said in verse 8 of chapter 1 that he determined in his heart not to defile himself with the king's food. We know they had dietary laws and the king wasn't going to be living by that. It most probably was sacrificing that food to idols and it talks about that in the Old Testament. It talks about you know when you get in these lands and you go with them to their sacrifices. If you eat the food, you're defiling yourself with these food sacrificed to demons. He was determined not to defile himself, but something interesting that Hebrew word is that it also means redemption. He got that free meal ticket. That was the first good thing that happened to him after he was abducted and hauled across the country and put into this school. He didn't object to learning the language. He didn't object to going to school. He objected to breaking a law of his religion. And he stood firm. And because of that, he had the power to stand against the government and against the pressures of those around him. But that word redemption, not to defile himself, he wasn't going to redeem himself. That's why I can say faith is living without scheming. Because scheming is you're trying to work things out and redeem yourself, redeem the situation, do what you think is right, instead of going to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? That's a big difference. And that's where we all have to get in the Christian life because Hearing from God is the most basic element of the Christian life, a relationship with the living God. God is there and he wants to communicate with you. I mean, when you read a book like John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God and the Word was God. What does the Word do? It expresses the meaning that someone has to someone else. God wants to communicate with us. And if we miss that, we miss the whole thing because it is about relationship. So how do we know what to do? We go to his word, we go into prayer, 
and God will show us what to do. And today's an excellent example of how this works. We're talking about the dietary laws and how he stood for them. He said he wouldn't defile himself. Can you think of anything in your life that could be defiling you? In Song of Solomon, it says the little foxes spoil the vineyard. It's the little things that creep in that eventually bring us down. A little breaking our words, a little staying on a website too long, looking at something we're not supposed to. Those are the things that bring us down. They eventually change the way we think and what we're looking at and what we desire. And those are the little things that bring us down. But Daniel picked his fights. And that what nobody would have known. Nobody would have cared. Out of 10,000, around 10,000, some people even estimate higher than that, of people that were taken on that first wave with Nebuchadnezzar. You only see four guys standing up for what's right. You see four guys saying, we're not going to eat the king's food. You only see four guys in the next chapter when we come back next week who don't bow down to this idol. Four guys. Well, Daniel wasn't there. He was probably out of town, but the three that were there wouldn't bow down and, uh, you know, under threat of their life. Do what we believe, do we really believe it? Because I've heard it said that if you don't believe something enough to lay down your life for it, then it's not worth living for. It's something to think about. Identity. That was the first thing that gave him the strength to stand. God was his judge. He kept it. He maintained it. He was even known by his, by his godly identity. Uh, then faithfulness in small things. Daniel's example. When you're faithful in the small things, you open God's hand to bless you, to enable you to, to do what you need to do. And today you're going to see God come through in a powerful way when the executioners show up at Daniel's door. Who would you think about in this story would be called the servant of God? Somebody, look up Jeremiah 27, 6. How about the king of kings? Who's the king of kings? 27, 6. Yeah. And now I have given all these lands to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And beast of the field, I have also given to serve. So he's given the whole, everybody in the world and even the animals to serve Nebuchadnezzar, his servant, the servant of God. Isn't that wild? The God calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. Verse 37 of this chapter 2. O king, Daniel's talking to him. O king, you are the king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. The king of kings, the servant of God. It's just kind of interesting when you think about how God identifies him. one of the most brutal in, in history up to that time. But pretty good bet that we're going to see Nebuchadnezzar in eternity. When you get done by the end of the story, you realize, man, God was wanting to reveal himself to Nebuchadnezzar. There was something in Nebuchadnezzar that wanted to know the truth. And if we want to know the truth, God will reveal himself to us. But it's so powerful that even today, in today's lesson, we're going to see God reveal not only that he's God to Nebuchadnezzar, but he's going to show Nebuchadnezzar the history of the, human, of the planet Earth, of all the empires of the planet Earth, starting with him and going all the way through past our time. Still things that are still unraveling and being unveiled today. He shows to Nebuchadnezzar. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but the kingdom of the Lord endures forever. And that's part of the, the message today. So Heavenly Father, I help ask you to uh, show us things in your word today that, God, that we can actually apply to our lives, Lord. Help us to learn some principles from Daniel, this man that's faithful in a hostile land. God, as we live in a land that's becoming increasingly hostile to Christians and Christianity and to the Word of God, God, I pray that we'll learn how to pick our battles, that we'll be able to have a respect for authority, that we'll be able to stand like Daniel did, that we'll dare to be a Daniel. I ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Daniel, chapter 2. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. And his spirit was so troubled that he couldn't sleep. His sleep left him. So he had these dreams. And notice he's had dreams, more than one. And it left him so upset that he couldn't even sleep. So the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. 
Now, when it says to tell him his dreams, he wants to make known and explain to him what this dream means. You remember last week I was talking about kind of how shrewd Nebuchadnezzar was? He was a very smart man. And part of it is like taking all these, making this all-star team of leaders. He took the best and the brightest from the other nations he conquered, brought them in, taught them the language, taught them uh, the literature, and then he moved them up into the government. So he had this all-star team of, of government leaders from all over the world that could speak all different languages, that knew all the different cultures. But also, you know, it kept the people at home in check because he left the uh, puppet king in charge and he's collecting taxes from him. And it's like, you know, if you mess up, we got your kids you know, hostages, so you guys do right. So they were pretty smart. Now this is, this is really smart, what he does here. And I think, I've heard people say that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream, but when Daniel started telling the dream, he knew what it was. See, I think what happened is, Nebuchadnezzar inherited all these guys from his dad, right? All these wise men, astrologers, soothsayers, and these are all pagan guys, this is like a cult the way they do things. They cast bones and they do all this stuff to figure out what things mean. And supposedly they're going to tell him what this dream means, right? And Nebuchadnezzar is thinking, if these guys can really tell me what this means, they should be able to tell me what the dream is, right? If they really know what they're talking about, they should be able to tell me what the dream is. And if they don't, then I'm getting rid of them. You know, I don't want these guys on the payroll. So I think, I just think it's another shrewd move, you know, I, I think it's possible that he forgot part of the dream and only knew part of it. I know sometimes I wake up, but you know, uh, the dreams that I've had from the Lord have been very vivid. There's something about them that's different. There was something in there so disturbing to him that he could not sleep or get it out of his mind. So he called these guys in and instead of just saying, here's the dream and you guys make up something, he's like, I want to know for sure what this means. So you tell me what the dream means? and then I'll believe the answer. So I think that's what's going on. In verse three, he says, the king said to them, I have had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know or to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. And see, we're seeing the book now change into the Aramaic language. That was the language of the Babylonians. It started in Hebrew, the language that Daniel was speaking when he got taken into captivity. When, they, when these guys come back from captivity, they're all speaking Aramaic. You know, Jesus spoke Aramaic. That's because of this right here, where these people were in this captivity in Babylon. So, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we'll give you the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision, or my command, is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made into a heap of ashes. And this is something they actually used to do. You know, this guy's kind of ruthless, but he's like, listen, if you guys are pulling my leg, you're toast, man, you're kibble and bits, you know, this is it, you know, you tell me what the dream is. He goes, however, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. And they answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. I imagine they're getting pretty nervous right now. <laughs> and the king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, you know, until something changes to see, but my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the time has changed or until the situation changes or I get over this urgency. Therefore, tell me the dream and I'll know that you can give its interpretation. Then the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. That may be true, but if you look over verse 22, you see that there's a God. He reveals deep secrets. He knows what's in the darkness. In verse 23, in the middle of it, he says, and he made known to Daniel what the dream was. And in verse 28, he says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and will make known to Nebuchadnezzar. So it's true, he's setting the stage for Daniel to really show out here because if Daniel comes up with the interpretation, they already said no man can do it. There's no man on the earth who can tell the king's matter. 
It's a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods. So he's setting the stage for Daniel to really show who's really God. There's one God, a king of kings, above Nebuchadnezzar. And the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So he's gonna kill them all and they began killing them. So these people are already starting to get slaughtered. Guy comes knocking on Daniel's door. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariok. So this guy Ariok bangs on its door and it says he was the captain of the king's guard. It comes from a word, it's really interesting. The tabach, Hebrew word, also can mean like a cook. It's a cook that would like uh, kill the animals and then cook them. A slaughterer. A slaughterer. This was the head of the assassins that came to Daniel's door. And he's coming there to kill him. He had gone out, it says, then, then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Ariok, the captain of the guard, the captain of the king's executioners, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. That's his job, go kill the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Ariok, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Why, are, why is it so harsh? Then Ariok made the decision known to Daniel, he explained it to him. See, this is another place where Daniel has favor with these people, they have got to know Daniel, they like Daniel. Daniel's had respect for authority up to this point. You saw how he came to the head of the eunuchs and he asked, you know, to have permission to eat different food. He was, he was a respectful man, he was a good man, the people liked him, and this, this, this head of the assassins listened to him. And he said, why is it so urgent? And so he explained it to him. He didn't have to explain it to him. He was there to kill him. All he had to do was kill him and his job would have been done, right? So he explains to him what's happening. What would you have done? What would you do in that situation? Here comes the guy, he's at your door. He's ready to kill you because they didn't even know why they were being killed, right? The guy just shows up and said, listen, the king ordered all the wise men to be killed. So he, he asked him, why is it so urgent? Why is it so harsh? And he explains it to him. But Daniel has something else that he wants to do here. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time. See, it's interesting when you look back in chapter 2, uh, 19, it says, Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And that word before means in near proximity. They were close to the king. They had access to the king. So Daniel makes a beeline to the king, and he asks him, that he might have some time. Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house so that he could pray. And he got these other guys to come in and pray with him. He's depending on God to give him the answer. Daniel went into his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah's companions that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning the secret. So Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So during the night, God showed him. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Uh, this is a good principle right here. You don't see him jumping up and running into the king's palace. He starts worshiping God. He knows what happened. God just intervened and he takes time to worship. He's not like, I'm saved, I'm going, I'm running. <laughs> Let me tell you the answer. He stops right there and he starts worshiping the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, answered God, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might, and now have made known to me what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore Daniel went to Ariok, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. 
And this is interesting too, that he didn't say, bring me into the king, I got the answer. He said, stop killing everybody first. He interceded for those guys first. This is a this is an example of agape love. It's not a squishy, ooey gooey love. It's something that does the best for others and puts lays itself down. We're we're seeing such a great example in Daniel all the way through. He got the answer. First of all, he didn't panic. He got he went he went and asked for time so he could pray. He was trusting God. And second of all, God showed him the answer. Then he didn't just hop up to save himself. He thanked God. Took time to worship. Then the very next step he did was make sure these other guys saved the rest of the guys' lives. These are just pagan <laughs> cultists, you know, and still he intervened for their lives to save their lives. And then he told Ariok that he knew what the king wanted. Take me before the king and I'll tell the king the interpretation. This is kind of interesting. Look at what this guy does. Then Ariok quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found the man. I have found a man in the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Like he's been out looking, you know, for the guy who knew. <laughs> he, was, he came there to kill him, right? Daniel uh, asked for some more time. And now that Daniel has the answer, he's like, I found him, I found the man that has the answer. Anyway, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I, which I have seen and its interpretation? And Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God. Oh. All right. <laughs> we can stop right there, right? There is a God. There is a God in heaven who reveals secrets or mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days? What's going to happen from that day on through the rest of history as far as regarding world empires? Man, this is, a, this is an amazing revelation right here. What will be in the latter days? Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret or this mystery has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, but for our sakes, God's shown them that to save their lives, who make it known, the interpretation to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your heart. So God is revealing this not only to save Daniel and his friend's life, but he wants to show some of the Nebuchadnezzar. Man, this is part of the whole book that God is reaching out to this pagan king and he wants to reveal himself to this king. I think that's a tremendous thing because this king was known as violent, cruel, oppressive, but he's also known as God's servant. God raised him up to bring judgment upon Israel, but God wants him to know who he is. There's something in Nebuchadnezzar's heart that wants to know the truth and God's going to show him. You, O king, were watching. This is the dream now. And behold, a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms were silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. This would be kind of a baked clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hand which struck the image at its feet of the iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor and the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now he didn't just look at Nebuchadnezzar and say, does that sound right? He was confident that he heard from the Lord. Look what he said. This is the dream. Now we'll tell you the interpretation of it before the king. When it says that this rock came down and hit the feet of this statue, the whole thing's crushed and turned into like chaff. You know, chaff is when you get wheat or something and you break off the hull and it's just that thin skin on the outside and you throw it up in the air and the wind blows it away. That whole statue became like chaff and the whole thing blew away. This stone was the important thing. And so Nebuchadnezzar's looking at this statue, and I imagine when he saw it, 
he's probably thinking, man, that's awesome, you know, and he's thinking about some has something to do with his kingdom and his might and something like that, and suddenly it's smashed by this stone that becomes this huge mountain and takes over the whole earth, and he's like, man, what is this? What happened? This is the interpretation. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So imagine Nebuchadnezzar is feeling pretty good right now. He's a big head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. So Nebuchadnezzar is probably thinking, uh-oh. See how this would affect his brain? <laughs> He's the head of gold, the king of kings, but there's another king to come. King, kingdom coming. In uh, chapter 5, verse uh, 28, it tells us Medo-Persian kingdom. The third empire is going to be Greece. I like it when you're making notes. The third empire is Greece, the one of bronze, and that's in chapter 8, it tells you them. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Remember, that's the legs of iron. As much as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. That's the Roman Empire. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with the ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile or brittle. As you saw the iron. So, you know, if this is showing all the empires of the earth, you know what this could very well be? pointing out that the last empire of the earth is going to be this mixture a stone a stone that's cut out without human hands and all the way through the Bible Jesus is this last empire where it's talking about the clay and the iron this mixture there's something really powerful about this because see I believe we're living in that empire and and what happened is we got a mixture and, and even in the church you have people that live half by the Bible and half by what the world says you know, when we talk about Dagon, the god of the Philistines, half man and half fish. You know, when he was around, when, you know, we know that people in the church, when they're around the other people, they act like the men. When they're around the church people, they act like the fish. You know, it's half man, half fish, this mixture. You know, God is looking for a Daniel who's willing to take a stand for what God says when the nation or the government or people come in opposition to God's purposes and his direct commands to us, He's looking for people that'll stand for what he stands for. Even in the small things, this is what's so important about Daniel because nobody would have known if he would have just ate the king's food. 10,000 other people are there and they all wishing they could eat the king's food and the few that could are really happy they can. He's taking a stand on something that nobody else would blame him for doing. But because of that, because he's standing for what God said and doing what's right just for God, God empowers him to rise up in that empire. Gives him wisdom and ability to interpret dreams, which is right here what he's doing that's going to propel him to the head of all these guys. He's going to be one of the leaders in this empire now after this. But think about this mixture. It's in the church. People will quote scripture, read scripture, and then they'll act like the world. There's a mixture. It talks about it being brittle or fragile. That takes away the strength, the power of God is manifested when we are willing to do what God says and go wholeheartedly for it. That's when the power of God, when we do what's right when no one else is looking, when we do the things that we know, like if we're in a community and we have spiritual mentors and we have things like that and they're giving us direction and we do that, regardless of whether it seems right to us or not, what God does is honors that and starts moving us up. You know, I was just thinking about David and Saul. David was an anointed king, yet Saul was still king. Saul was rejected because what? He was a mixture. He, he did what God told him to do, but then when it came right down to, to it, he yielded what the people wanted him to do. And then instead of confessing that he did wrong, he said, I did what you said to do. And Samuel's like, well, what's the bleeding of these sheep I hear in my ears? You know, you were told to kill all the animals. Well, those are just the good ones that we say to sacrifice to your God. And, and here's the king. Well, didn't we tell you to kill the king? Yeah, but, you know, we're <laughs> he never did confess. He just wanted to look good in front of the people. So 
Samuel said, listen, to obey is better than sacrifice. Now David is anointed king, and for years he is under Saul's authority. And Saul is trying to kill him, runs him off. David's hiding in caves, uh, wilderness areas, running from this madman that's trying to kill him. And Saul is the king. And then David has two chances to kill him, and David won't do it. David says, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. In other words, David trusted his destiny to God. He wasn't sitting there trying to work it out, connive, figure out the best way to do it. He was like God had promised him something and he was going to hang on and do it and be faithful where he was planted. Even though it seemed unfair, it was a very difficult situation. Mixture this represents the world we're in now. And I really want you to think about this. He's showing the empires of the whole world. We're in the last stage. We're in the mixture stage. And we're seeing this national, international consciousness rising up and everybody's becoming unified through the technology and the internet and everything. But does that make it right? Or is God's purpose is still what we need to adhere to and stand with? So in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Remember that rock hits the image and it breaks it up. That is the, the kingdom that God is going to set up which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be left to other people it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mount without hands, because Jesus wasn't made, right? Jesus was there with God. He was, a, he was cut out without hands. And he came out from God. And it broke into pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is true. Then Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face. This is the greatest king in the world at this time. He had ultimate power. The three superpowers had collided at Karshemesh, uh, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, and the Babylonians, and he won. He was in charge of the whole planet. And he falls on his face in front of Daniel. He knows God is doing something here, and he is an awestruck. He fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, Truly, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, since you can reveal this secret. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. This was to be called, they're the magi. The, the administrators, that's where we get our word magistrate, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, the chief, you know, like the chief of the of the uh, guard, when it's chief, that word's rab, or rob, rab, rob mag. This is him, rob mag, the head of the magi. We see him when Jerusalem falls, when Nebuchadnezzar's army comes back and destroys Jerusalem and the temple outside the gate is sitting the Rab Mag, Daniel, with the other leaders of Babylon. And of course they spare Jeremiah's life and Daniel gets a copy of the scroll of Jeremiah. He refers to it later. He knows exactly how long they're gonna be in captivity. Remember 70 years and that he's reading Jeremiah's thing. Daniel is a key part of this empire now and Daniel's gonna be involved in the history from now all the way through to the time of Christ. Jesus is talking about Daniel and right into our time now, these prophecies are still being fulfilled. This is an amazing thing that happened because this guy was decided to draw a line about his food. The little things are what determine the outcome. If we're faithful in little, God will trust us with much. Daniel petitioned the king that he should set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. <laughs> well Heavenly Father God I just thank you for this book Lord I thank you Father for this example of Daniel I pray that we'll be able to be faithful in small things Lord that you'll help us Lord to, to realize the battles that we need to fight and realize the battles we need to let go of that you would help us Father God to trust you in the circumstances in the overwhelming circumstances when the executioner shows up at our door and death's hanging there Lord that we wouldn't panic but that we would take the time to seek you, seek your face, and trust that you'll give us the answer. God, I just pray, Lord, that as we're faithful to you, Father God, 
that others will understand that there is a God in heaven, a God in heaven that reveals secrets to people, that it will lift us up out of those places of, of despair and of hurt and brokenness, Lord, that you are there, that you care, that you intervene in the lives of men. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to have this divine mentor in your word. Lord, and I pray we'll dare to be Daniels in our culture and society. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.